Welcome to this week's GCN Tech Clinic. It's not rocket science. You send in your questions using the hashtag AskGCNTech and then we answer them. Let's dive straight in with our first question, which is from Fares P, who asks, how do you approach an unavoidable pothole? Bunny hop will slow down as much as possible. Which is better? Um, well, if you're confident in your bunny hopping skills, the best thing you can do is bunny hop straight over it and just avoid it. And you'll be able to carry on with your ride as if nothing else has happened. But if you are riding in a group or there's somebody behind you, then you do need to shout and be mindful so that the riders behind you can hopefully do the same bunny hop technique as you or just have enough time to miss the pothole and carry on safely with their ride. You do need to be pretty careful with some potholes though. They can be quite nasty. Not only do you run the risk of particularly puncturing, or maybe even damaging your wheel or your bike, you also have the risk of crashing, which um, I've got first-hand experience of. So be mindful of the potholes and let the fellow riders you're with know all about them as well. Our next question is from CycleQ who asks, for anti-theft or tracking, do you think the Apple AirTag could be attached to a bike. Yeah, yeah, I think that could be possible. I mean, it's not specifically designed for a bike, but you could attach it underneath a saddle or depending on what frame you've got, you could attach it into that. Although the sort of Apple AirTag is designed with Bluetooth technology. So that means that your phone can pick up this tag. So with it, it needs to be within Bluetooth range, basically. So if your bike is within that range, Chances are you're going to be able to see it and you won't really be struggling to find it. If someone has stolen your bike, obviously it's not going to be near you or your phone. So you are reliant upon it being picked up by another AirTag device or another device within that AirTag network. Um, and then that can alert your phone that has been picked up and it will alert you of the exact location. Although it's not sort of ideal for, for tracking a bike because like I say, you're reliant upon someone else being near your bike that happens to have the right sort of app on their phone and such like that. So not necessarily the greatest thing. Maybe the best thing for the Apple AirTag is just to stick to using it for your keys. There are, however, lots of other devices specifically designed for tracking your bike. So check those out online and try and find one that suits the needs of you. Our next question in is from Alex Oye, who says, Hey Alex, why does the indoor trainer feel so much harder than when I'm riding outside? I have a wheel on trainer and I'm using the tires that I would ride with when I'm outside. Is it me being weak as a cyclist or is it my equipment? Thanks. Well, it's gonna vary a lot depending on the type of trainer you've got. I know you've said you've got a wheel on trainer, but you could have a smart trainer or it could be a, a, a dumb trainer or a real old school turbo trainer. Um, so it's going to vary slightly depending on what you've got. But what you do need to be mindful of with the uh, wheel on trainers is A, that your tire pressure is set correctly and B, that you very carefully follow the calibration process specific to the turbo trainer or training setup that you've got. The wheel on trainers are very sensitive to changes in how they've been calibrated or even the tire pressures. So focus on getting that correct and I think you'll probably be okay. But if you've got all of that done and you still find that it doesn't really replicate like what is riding outside, well then chances are it might be time to invest in a new indoor trainer. I know, amazing news, isn't it? You can buy the latest and greatest smart trainer. But if you haven't got that possibility, then unfortunately you're gonna have to just stick with what you got and suck up the fact that it is a bit heavy going because that's what some of these older models did tend to feel like. There you go. On to our next question, which is from Jacob Haven. It says, hi, I've noticed that my rear tire, Continental GP5000, has worn down slightly more than my front tire. Is this normal? I've been thinking about swapping them front to rear, but is this recommended? And first up, yeah, it is totally normal. The rear tire will wear down more than the front one. And the reason behind this, firstly, you've got most of your weight over the back wheel of the bike. And then secondly, that rear wheel is the driven wheel. So it has all the force from your pedaling action driving the bike forward. And as such, that increased friction will wear the tire away quicker than what the front tire will wear away. Yep, you can swap them around front to back to try and even that wear out a little bit. But if you notice that your rear tire has sort of got a bit of a flat edge to it and it's just flatted off on the top, then I don't recommend putting that on the front because it won't be greatest to 
give you best control and handling characteristics for your bike. So it's flatted off on the top edge. Unfortunately, you're gonna to have to replace that tire. Our next question is in from Rider21, who asks, hey guys, is it true that deep section wheels are more fragile on cobble climbs, for example? No, no, it's not true. Deep section wheels are not any more fragile than slightly shallower wheels. What will vary is whether the, well, the material that the wheel is made from. So it could be carbon fiber or it could be aluminium. Now, it tends to be that many of the deep section wheels are made of carbon fiber and carbon as a material is slightly more fragile than than alloy, but not in the sense that I think you would need to worry about riding over cobbles or certainly over cobble climbs. If anything, all of the wheels have to meet the same safety standards and the same safety tests. So when they're manufactured, all reputable manufacturers will have to put their wheels through that testing process. And that's same whether it's for alloy wheels, carbon wheels, shallow wheels, deep section wheels. So in theory, they all have the same levels of strength built into them. And as we know, the pro riders all use deep section wheels, and it's pretty rare now to ever see a pro rider using an alloy wheel. And they ride over all sorts of terrains, cobbled, the off-roads, all the classics, and they put the wheels through far more force and strain than you or I certainly would anyway. And it's very rare we ever see a wheel failure in a pro race. So in terms of your question, is it true that deep section wheels are more fragile? Nope, I don't think it is. Right then, on to our final question for this week, and it's from Simone Chiretta. Cool, hope I pronounced that correctly. And they ask, how should I clean my bike after it's just covered in dust from riding on dry, dirty roads? Do I still need the full water and soap treatment, or is dusting it off without water enough? Quite oh, yeah, a nice simple one to finish. And the simple answer is, if your bike's a bit dusty, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but if your chain is particularly dry, it's got no lubrication on it, and it's covered in dust and grit and grime, then you will need to give it a wash. There's no good just leaving all that on your chain because it's gonna wear out quicker than it otherwise would. So just give it a wash, make sure you degrease the chain if it needs it, and um, oh, you should be perfectly fine. But there's no harm in leaving a bit of dust on your bike and then heading out for another ride, maybe even another two if it's pretty dry and clean outside. That's it for this week's GCN Tech Clinic. Hope you found it helpful. And as always, keep those questions coming using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Um, guess I'll see you next week.